Sarah Milligan with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. I am in Purcell, Oklahoma today. It is uh, March 21st, 2016, and I'm talking to Ron Fishburn. Um, this is for the uh, Oklahoma State Stories Oral History Project. Done. That's it. Okay. Just Let's just start with telling me a little bit about yourself. I you know, who your parents were, what, a little bit okay. about your family, where you're from, all that good stuff. Okay, I was born in Norman, Oklahoma mm -hmm. on July the 8th, 1933. My mom and dad were married in California, and then they left California to come back because the Depression was going on, and my grandfather, Tall Morfishburn, had a couple of farms in this area. So my dad wanted to come back and help his dad save the farm because the depression was going pretty strong in the 1930s. Yeah. And uh, so that was what, how I got here. And so I was born in a little deal in Norman, Oklahoma, and I wasn't expected to live. I was born with an open heart valve and a closed bile duct. But the doctor, which was just in those days, was a country doctor more or less, but he told his nurses that, that don't let me cry for 24 hours. And uh, so they walked the floor. This is my story that my mother told me. And so she, she, this was her first baby, and I was. And uh, So anyway, that's why I'm here today is because somebody cared enough about me to walk the floor and save me because then the next thing they did, you know, found out that my bile duct had closed up, my heart was back in good rhythm, and everything was working. So then that's why I grew up in Oklahoma. <laughs> and <laughs> so my, we, uh, we, I came to Noble, Oklahoma from the hospital. It's, uh -huh. it's a, it was a little clinic actually, it wasn't a hospital in Norman then. The only hospital in Norman at that time was the one out at the Institute there, you know, what, what we call it. Uh, uh, we called it a crazy hospital, but anyway, that was where my grandfather, Pulliam, had died later on. But uh, anyway, I was made it, and so we lived in Noble first few months of my life until I was a little round, fat baby, and uh, so then... We moved over into what we call the Bottoms across from Noble mm -hmm. and uh, grew up on a farm there as far as the first, uh, until I was six years old. And then I had to start first grade. My first grade was at Ladd School, which was two miles away. And I walked to school every day that summer. Then dad realized that you know, that that wasn't going to be a good deal to raise a young boy because I'd had a brother by then. There was two of us at home. And so I was six and he was four. So he traded part of the farm for a grocery store in Goldsby that was right across from the schoolhouse. And so 1939, I was six years old and... Uh, we moved to the grocery store, and when my brother and I walked in there and we saw the candy counter, we all went crazy. <laughs> so we lived there from 1939 up until 1946. I was in the seventh grade at Goldsby then when my dad bought another farm down by Purcell. And so we all moved to the Purcell area and bought us. A little 60-acre farm there with a it had running water. It was modern. That's the first time we'd lived in a modern house. Even when you had the grocery store. Yeah, we just had outdoor toilet, and we lived in a room. Our family lived. It, my brother and I and my mother and dad lived in a room not much bigger than the one we're sitting in right now. It had a bed in it and uh, had a little place to cook a little bit. But we were very poor people, as you might say. They're the, you know, and we, but we didn't know it. We just had fun because we could run around outside and play on the playground at the school. Mm -hmm. We went and the schoolhouse was right there. And if mom wanted us to come and eat supper, she'd just bang on the 
pole out in front of the grocery store because we sold gasoline there all during World War II. And that was where I spent World War II. And they built the uh, air base right by Goldsby, which there's the airfield now. And so my brother and I would sit on top of our old store building there and watch the old airplanes fly off and on and come and land and go. And they were the old yellow steermans. And we got a real insight into aviation as little kids. And uh, we loved to see airplanes fly. And uh, I've got a picture out here, one that I finally got to fly one of them as I became an old man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you that story later. But, yeah. but anyway, that was the beginning. And uh, so we moved to Purcell. And then as a seventh grader at an old North school, and there's a picture of it around here somewhere or another. And, uh, but there, anyway, then I graduated from the eighth grade, then went to Purcell High School and was in the FFA, uh, Future Farmers of America. That was a big thing back right after World War II. And uh, so the Korean War came on and uh, my ag teacher says, Ron, you don't want to be drafted into the army as a private. I said, you want to, you want to get to be an officer if you want to go to war. And so I said, that sounds like a good deal. So he was able to get me a hundred dollar scholarship to go to Oklahoma A&M College in Army ROTC. And so I took that and I went up there to interview about going to school at Oklahoma A&M. And I told them, I said, I have to work. I can't, my parents are too poor. They can't send me to college. And uh, so he said, oh, he said, there's no way you can go to college and work. You just, it's not impossible. And I said, well, that's the only way I can go. And I said, I know I can do it. And so anyway, he agreed, the guy that was running the program, you know, for kids to get jobs at college, and so finally he agreed, okay, we'll let you work in the cafeteria. Well, they had just built Bennett Hall, which was a brand new place for everybody to live, one of the largest men's dormitories in the United States at that time. And so I got a letter back and said, if you could come up before school starts, you can work in the cafeteria feeding the training table for... Uh, but at, for the athletes, the football team, and you get paid 50 cents an hour. And I said, and so I did. I just packed up. My mother took me up to Stillwater in the old bread pickup. And I got out and I walked into that great big old building. And I said, wow, you know, this will hold a bunch of hay, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I got my start in college by working in Bennett Hall. And what was so neat about it was that all the guys I worked with were all, had already been one year of college, so they wanted to teach me everything I needed to do be, to be ready for my freshman year. And so I lived in uh, Hanner Hall because Bennett Hall was full. So my first year was in Hanner Hall, and, uh, and then I had to ride my bicycle board to Bennett Hall. And anyway, it was such a fun deal and I enjoyed it so much working and, and around all those people and uh, I hadn't found any girlfriends or anything so I was studying all the time. So my first semester at Oklahoma a and I made a 3.5 GPA. Of course that would be the last time that ever happened. <laughs> and uh, so anyway college started its own and you know it was really a neat experience. And so after about three years of it, you know, you had to declare a major and pick out some something that you wanted to do. So I looked at most all my friends were just were the agronomy course and they were taking different thing, animal husbandry, or they were taking chicken raising or anyway. I looked and there was there was only be five graduates a year in the soil science program taught by Dr. Fenton Gray. And I thought, well, now that would probably, that would be, ensure me of having a job 
whenever I would graduate. So anyway, I started in the soils program with Dr. Gray and, and there was two other uh, people named Reed, Robert Reed and another Reed. And so they took me in and I could work in their soils lab and I, do, I did all this stuff. Dr. Gray even let me be an assistant and mapping soils for him in one course and things like that so that whenever I got ready to graduate I had a soils agriculture degree in soil science and that was opened up. I, Eisenhower had hired a guy the Secretary of Agriculture that would map all the soils in the United States so for agricultural purposes mm -hmm. and so Doc Gray says I can get you a job and so he signed me up with the Soil Conservation Service in 1956. And uh, so I got the job. Dr. Ralph Murphy, he was the soil scientist that was heading up the whole program for the United States. And he was a soil scientist that was heading it up out at Boy City, Oklahoma, in Cimarron County. We were going to map Cimarron County starting in that time frame. So I arrived in Boy City, Oklahoma, February the 6th, 1956. And I got out there and the tumbleweeds was going right down the main street. And I said, what kind of world have I come to? And we laughed about it, but I made some of the best friends in the world out there. Doc Gray had told me, he said, Ron, You'll go out there and you will have such a good time and you will find the prettiest girl in Cimarron County and you'll take her to be a wife. And I thought, well, that's crazy. And that's what happened. Really? And I married Pat Robinson. She was the prettiest girl in Cimarron County. And my friend, Ferris P. Allgood, he married Aggie Cooper, who was just that we're all in the same group of people because we were college graduates in a little bitty town and all the high school girls were looking for a, a college graduate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how it all happened. And it was really interesting. But that ended my soils deal. So I came back to Purcell with my wife. And I hadn't even told my parents about it. So when I got here, I said, Mother, here's your new daughter-in-law. Were they... Uh, how did they react to that? <laughs> they loved her. They did took her in. They knew that I'd made the right decision. And uh, so it, it worked out good. So, And that marriage lasted 49 years. Oh, gosh, yeah. And uh, she gave me seven kids. So it's sort of interesting how that, you know, and I lay it all off on Heavenly Father. You know, there was a higher power that that it is. And I've always believed in that. That was a, mm -hmm. was really an important thing to realize that, you know, you don't just happen into this, but there's a plan that's laid out by a higher power, which I call my Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm still alive today. But anyway, I got to that point and got back here in Purcell, had a farm machinery business, sold tractors and traded, got in the motor freight business and stuff like that, you know. Well, so I, I have a couple of questions about, um, was, this is going way back to earlier, yeah. but just, I, I'm curious, since your dad bought a farm in 1946 and you all moved to Purcell then, yeah. um, and it sounds like Tinker Air Force was building up around you where you were before, right? Yeah. Did well, no, Tinker wasn't. It wasn't Tinker? It, no, it was Norman. The, uh, uh, the Navy base at Norman, see, that all came into play in 1941 and 42. See, they bought, that's why Max Westheimer Field now, you know, the big airfield at Norman that they give back to the city and everything. See, that was a Navy base in 1941. Right. Oh, okay. I see. And that's, we were watching the airplanes. They would fly from Norman down to Goldsby, mm -hmm. and that was our training field there. So that's how that all worked. 
did that, so did that, um, 1946, right after the end of World War II, did that have anything to do with the timing of the move, or was it just a coincidence? The move was that Dad bought land because what happened at the end of World War II, the Alice Chalm, because he had started the Alice Chalmers business in 1939. Uh -huh. Well, they closed it down for the war effort. Alice Chalmers went in to build tanks and everything else. And so he couldn't, didn't have it. He lost his business then, and so he went strictly farming all during World War II and lived at the store in Goldsby. And that we did that from 1941 on up to 1945. Mm -hmm. See, so then he was able then to get back in the Alice Chalmer business. That's what brought us back to Purcell. So, so that's why he decided to buy a farm in Purcell, and we sold the grocery store and got out of that. So he usually tried to sell everything in seven years. That was his sort of uh, deal that he liked to trade every seven years, which turned out to be sort of right in his old life, that, that he changed stuff and moved or did something or another. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he was a good businessman. He was uh, probably not as he was too good, really, <laughs> you know, and uh, he, wor did, he worried about people more than he worried about making money. Mm -hmm. But he may always made enough money, we always had to get time, because when we bought the little farm, my mother said he'd borrowed $8,000 to buy the farm. And she says, we'll never be able to pay for it, and she couldn't stand to be in debt. Well, you know, at the end of the first year, he had already made enough money on his cattle, he paid for the farm. And so, anyway, then, he, she didn't like for him to borrow money, but he was the kind of a person that liked to use other people's money to make money with. And so, he, he wallered around, and we did it all right, and he always took good care of us. And he was very, very well, very well known and liked by everybody in Purcell, Oklahoma. So he was primarily cow farmer? He did cows, hogs was one of his big ones too, both of them. And he would grow the grain for them all, you know, and stuff like that. And that's why I grew up on driving tractors, plowing fields, and doing all of that, you know, all during my, up till I went to college. So how many siblings did you have? Just the My one? little brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just one. Yeah, my mother couldn't have any more kids. She could only have two. Uh -huh. So I know that part of you ended up going to A&M. It sounds like because you had an FFA teacher who was a good... Oh, yeah counselor. He, excellent man. If, if it hadn't been for him, I would not be where I'm at today, I'm sure. Paul McKinley was one of the greatest agriculture teachers because one we had before that was a, just sort of a bum, you know, because he didn't, you know, at back the, when the war started, all of those people went off to war. And our ag teacher that I had in 1940 six time frame was he couldn't pass a physical so he just he was able to become an ag teacher but we didn't know it us kids we liked him because he just partied with us you know and we had a great time but then it was fortunate that that when the war got over and the guys got back from war and went to school up in Stillwater and all become ag teachers then that's when the FFA program really started to really mature and build good programs. Mm -hmm. And I got to be on the last two years of that. My brother was in all four years of the good guy stuff. So, yeah. He, he had two different ones. Yeah. So out of all the different places, was there a reason that Oklahoma A&M was what you were looking at? Well, it was agriculture. So you knew at that point you were going to do Yeah, something we just knew it. You know, and that was, you know, I went to that institution and when I arrived up there and they took good care of me, let me work. And I worked my way through it all the four and a half years. And, uh, you know, they were, it was like home. Stillwater just became my second home. And it still is today. Stillwater is still, that's why I wanted my kids and my grandkids and everybody to go to Stillwater. And uh, because it was home. And you know, and the institution is so good. It was just, 
fabulous. So I, I have two questions from that. The first okay. one is you were, so you were able to work on campus. Yes. And pay for all of your tuition, all of your room and board, everything for the four because years. Because tuition at that time was $48 a semester. <laughs> Yeah, but still a lot. I mean, yeah, you know, but it's I was working for fifty cents an hour. So, if I uh, took and worked a hundred and twenty hours a month, I could get sixty dollars, and that paid for all of my room and board. My dad, because I worked at worked for him in the summer, then he gave me the hundred dollars, pay the tuition. So that paid the tuition for the whole year. Yeah. Got it. Isn't yeah, that amazing? It. It, it, it is amazing. <laughs> but when I graduated, I didn't know anybody anything. Mm -hmm. That is it is amazing. And you know, and I had a college degree. I was the first one of the Fishburns in, in my grandfather's line to have a college degree. So did your... Was there a college degree on your mother's line? No, she didn't. She was just she, but she did graduate from high school at Oklahoma City. And what's ironic is that the building that my mother went to high school in and graduated from is now the building that was bought by the Oklahoma City University Law School, and where my son is going to college. Full circle. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. That's it. And I mean, whenever I was up there visiting the dean at the, at the Oklahoma City University and said, well, this is where my mother graduated from high school. She said, oh, can I see the yearbook? I said, yeah, I can bring up the yearbook that's for you. That's pretty cool. You know, so that's pretty it's cool. amazing. That's what ties everybody uh -huh. to Oklahoma, and that's why that my oldest son wanted his kids to go to Oklahoma State University. And so his oldest daughter did. Yeah. And the others have gone to different places. And, but, you know, they all, uh, it's, it's just neat. So I have the, the house I'm living in right now up here is, is a hundred year old house and I've refurbished it. And uh, it's been our home since 1958, 515 North 8th Street. So when you moved back with your with your wife, Pat, yeah, you all moved into that house? Well, I bought it to be moved. It was had to be moved off of Main Street. So by buying the house for $1,500, and here it is, a four-bedroom old, old house, but it was in good condition. I bought it for that, then I had Roy Dollar move the house to, up on the present site for $800, took it from Purcell Main Street up on 8th Street, and then I had another friend of mine that made the, all the foundation for it for another $1,000, and then I've had another friend uh, who was in the plumbing business, he plumbed it, put in a septic system and all that, then I started working on the structural of it by cleaning it, fixing it, and all that stuff. So, so that has been our family home since the kids were just little bitty guys. So you kept that house even though you... was in the military. I yeah, still, you moved My mom lot. and dad lived in it most of the time. Got it. Um, it's interesting how that all works. Yeah, right? But it's home, and so when I got ready to retire from the military, we had a, the meeting of the family, so we had at that time we had four children that were high school age, or grade school and high school. And I said, where do we want to live? Because I owned land in Utah, owned land in, out in New Mexico and, and everything. And they said, oh, Dad, let's go back to the old big barn. That's what they called it. <laughs> and Pat, my wife, said that would be a good idea. So we moved, when I retired in 1980, we came back to the old house. Didn't have any air conditioning or heat or anything. It was just, but it, had been, it was solid. And so I spent the next two years refurbishing that old house before I went to work for real estate. And uh, uh -huh. 
So anyway, that's where we raised our last four kids, was that old big house. And now they think it's, they come back home, it's home. Yeah, I can see, yeah. Well, yeah. we'll and we'll come back to, yeah, come back how to how you got that. to all yeah. that, but, yeah. so let's go back to um, okay. Stillwater. Yeah. So what was it about Stillwater that, that gives you that feeling like home? It was because, uh, when I went to work in the cafeteria, then that became a fraternity. Because we all guys that worked in Bennett Hall, and we we washed pots and pans, and we did all of this stuff, and we made the best friends, and we and you know we were associated with each other. We even associated with all the the girls that lived in in all the other girl. Uh, dorm because they were all working the same way so the dietitians were so nice that they let us all mingle and you know whenever we were going to have a, a get together like in Bennett Hall our dietitian would let us have a square dancing down in the basement and so we organized square dance clubs and we've danced our way through college that way and met all the girls met the boys and the guys and so many of us, I didn't marry one of them, but my friends all married a lot of those. And whenever we had our 50th anniversary, graduation, then uh, there was one of the couples that showed up. And I hadn't seen them in 50 years. And they remembered me. And you remembered them, it sounds yeah. like. So how did you, was it, when you had square dances, was it just the kids who were working in yeah. the cafeteria? Uh-huh. <laughs> just the girls and boys. We started out dancing just boys and boys, and then we got the girls all involved. So, you know, we figured out ways, because those kind of kids were really good people. They weren't, you know, they were just good old country girls and good old country boys getting together on Saturday night and just enjoying. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we'd go to church on Sunday morning. And so, you know, that was the kind of things that built that relationship that was a family of people mm -hmm. that became our best friends forever and ever and ever. So that stayed your primary cohort while you were in college, even though you were in school of agriculture, that yeah. was your primary cohort. Yeah. Um, how did you... Oh, I got it. I wanted to be invited into a fraternity and stuff. And I examined that, but I didn't like, didn't like the fraternities guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were good guys, but in a lot of, I thought it was a lot of fun to, that as an independent, I could date some of the sorority girls that were presidents of the Pi Fives or the Phi, all that stuff. You know? uh -huh. But it was fun because we had the student union, which was really a center focal point to go dancing in the student union all the time and and had special programs there and then we had our special programs with all of the kids we worked with yeah so when you did the program with the school with the kids you danced with when you all would i mean that you worked with and you would have the basement square dances did yeah. you have recorded music and did yeah oh well, there was a guy there's an older person a man and his wife who liked to teach square dancing. And so they found out about us, and so we could, we could all, they would all volunteer then to come, and then so we finally, we were so good that we, a group of us then, we danced together as a group, and we would go up to Ponca City, and then when the Oklahoma City uh, had a big national square dance festival, and we went to that, you know, stuff like that. It just expanded. You know, and it all started in the basement, and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. It does sound like it got bigger. It did. It did. And it was great because any, and then we got all the freshman girls to come in, and, uh, you know, and here we were sophomores and juniors, so we had to pick of the litter. You know, it was a lot of fun. So you recruited the freshman girls to come dance in Ben and Paul, or it make, was it grown yeah. out by then? Ray grown out by then. Yeah. We had other places. <laughs> but it was, it's amazing how that back in that generation, 
you didn't have all of this stuff that they have now to, to mess with them. And that we had to figure out our own stuff. I didn't have a car at college until I was a junior. And we just we just didn't have any vehicles. They're too expensive, you couldn't afford one. My first little Ford car I bought from my cousin, I bought it for $150. I'd worked all summer and made $150. It was a 41 Ford Coupe. And I got to take that to college. And then the next time I got a Model A Roadster, took it to college. You know, stuff like that, you know, we, but we could always figure out ways, because in the summertime it'd work real hard and make some money. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, what what did you need a car for at school? Just all girls around. Primarily just a date? Yeah. <laughs> that was the main thing, because, you, because that's the only way you could get, get a girl out by herself, is in a car. <laughs> Where'd you go? Oh, out to Boomer Lake. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what all you do and... But it, but that's part of life and and part of growing up and seeing that and that's what you know because uh, we made friends with people that I'm still friends with today that we all went to college together and then we we did some things that it, it it has brought that OSU symbol into our whole family just because I went off to college back in 1951. Yeah. It's amazing. It is just so interesting. It's yeah. interesting how it stays with you. Yeah. It does. You know what? And then you see your children, your grandchildren, and uh, probably won't be too many years old. The great grandkids will all be. All, but they're all getting educated. Every one of my children have a college degree. Every one of the boys has a commission in the armed services. You know, they've all been successful parents. They've had ups and downs. Some have had divorces, some have had this, but they've all worked it all out. And just like Brett, who just called me now, checking on Dad. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what it's all about. It's whenever your kids come back to you and bring with them the love that they have and appreciation for their mother and for their father. And, uh, and they all want to come back home to the old big house. So is that what brought you back to Purcell? Yeah. They all voted for it, yes. We want to go back to the old big house. They call it the old big barn. Didn't have any central heat or air or anything in it. Hot, man, we got here in 1980. 100 degrees, no water. The lakes had dried up, you know, and it was... Were your parents still alive by then? Yeah. My, my dad was, my mom wasn't. And still lived in Purcell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my aunts and uncles all lived here. Is that what brought you back um, yeah. in the mid-50s when you came the back 50s, to Purcell? my dad, mom and dad, yeah. I knew that was home. Mm -hmm. And I was. I didn't like the job. I, I hated the job. I had been, I'd been, they'd canceled the job I had with soil conservation as a soil scientist and put me in as a work unit conservationist. And it was more of a political job. And so I worked in it for a couple of years, what a year I guess it was, and I hated it. And so I said, I'm going home. So Dad said, won't you come on home? So that was through the Department of Agriculture? Yeah. So I checked out of the net <laughs> and came home in January 58 with a new wife and another job to work for myself, hauling motor freight and selling farm machinery. I bet you knew all about it. Yeah. Um, when did you and your wife get married? If you if you didn't tell your parents till you came home in January, when yeah, did you? Yeah, we got married on uh, uh, January, I think it was, I'd have to look and see, but I think it's like the 15th of January, 58. Uh -huh. January 58, yeah. So you married her right before you left town and... I went run off to Clayton, New Mexico because that's where her mom and dad had got married. Oh, really? Right, by a... in Clayton, New Mexico. What? 
isn't that well i'm gonna not make any assumptions but yeah why would one run off to new mexico to get married from oklahoma because it was ch cheaper and easier we were running out of town we were escaping escaping who yeah anybody <laughs> you know that was a tradition you could run over to new mexico and get married and nobody would know about it. But usually you only did that if you didn't want somebody to know about it. We didn't. That's right. We didn't want nobody. She was pregnant. Oh. So did her parents know that you all were dating and knew that you were going to get married? Oh, or yeah. Or no, you just took off? Yeah. No, we... And there's a long story behind all of that. But uh -huh. it was really real. And... uh I made a decision which led, which was really another prophetic decision because, like I told you, the old professor had told me that I would marry a girl in Boy City. And she was the best thing that ever happened to me. And she was ready to leave. She wanted to out of Boy City so bad because her parents and her weren't getting along at all. And so she was tickled to death. And we didn't invite anybody to the wedding. We just went off and got married. Let's go back to soil yeah. conservation. Let's talk okay. about what I know so far is that you chose it because there were few people in it. That's and right. We not that it translates not to Not a lot of graduates. But in, in the soil science business, you had to take physics and math and all kinds of stuff that the normal ag guy and animal husbandry or something like that didn't have to do any of that stuff. Uh -huh. So it was a tougher course and like so, like plant scientists and so soil morphology. See, I took chemistry, I took, I, I guess it's either 18 or 26 hours of chemistry, you know, because you had to do all of this as part of the curriculum that Dr. Fenton Gray and his associates, the Reed brothers, were all there. And But I figured that if you took the most difficult one, that you should be able to make a living out of it. So, was, so were there... that was what it was all about, was that becoming a soil scientist assured you of having, starting out with a GS-5, then in the first year you could get to a GS-7, and then hopefully you'd get on up the line. And... Uh, but it had been very slow in the past because there had been not a lot of soil scientists developed, but it did. And I was on the very front end of all of it. And so it was a program just starting up when you got into yeah, it? Yeah, just starting up, yeah. I see. So it was, um, were there fewer people in the program because it was new and because it, it was tougher? was harder? It was tougher. It was hard. It took a little longer. I had to go an extra semester. Uh huh. I did go. I did four and a half years instead of four. So when you got started with the schoolwork in soil um, science, what did you think about it while you Loved were doing it. it? Really? Yeah, I was working with soil. You know, I was mapping soils, I was walking across it, watching it, seeing what was going on. It was an outside deal and. Uh, so then, and then the epitome of all was that whenever I got to go do the soil mapping itself, because I did the soil mapping as a, as a course at Stillwater, and I mapped a quarter section of land for Dr. Gray, you know, and then, I, then he wanted me to come back as an assistant, you know, uh, deal. So I got to work another semester teaching the kids to map soils. You know, I took them out on the farm and we did all the stuff, you know, so that was fun, and I knew it was something I liked to do. And so when you like to do something, that's good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then then it, it worked. Whenever I got to Boy City, Oklahoma, they just started a brand new team there. And, I, and the team was made up of some good friends of mine. And uh, one of the friends became a lifelong friend forever, and I still visit him. In Utah, him and his wife, we're all, we dated together, we run around together, we uh, we stayed in the same apartments together, you know, we're all, it's one of those kind of f friendships. Mm -hmm. And so those kind of things is what made it all work. So you 
Did you know when you chose soil science that there was a pretty good chance you were going to get a USDA job upon graduation? Well, Dr. Gray said he thought it would be. There was no guarantee, sure. but he thought. He said, I'm in on the ground floor of it, and he was. And so you got to get in the ground floor with the guys that you want to go do with. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't something that I had to go out and beg somebody for a job because my friend who had graduated a year ahead of me, he couldn't find a job because they hadn't started this program. And he had to be a, he had to just work for the state of Oklahoma going around checking, because uh, he had so much chemistry and everything like that. He was a checking cafes and stuff for to see if they were all uh, sterile, you know, and everything. Oh yeah, like But then safety. whenever this program opened up, then all of us guys who had done this a year before, we graduated a year, and I, I had luckily that I was right on the ground floor, and I just walked right in to a GS5 soil science job with the Department of Agriculture. So right when you graduated, basically. Yeah, I did graduate because I graduated in January, uh -huh. and on February the 6th, I was in Boy City, Oklahoma. Yeah. Mapping soils. A turt walked in and said, I'm here. And they said, well, you're too young. You know, I look like a, look, just look like that picture right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that is young. <laughs> so there were people that had come in to start the office that had graduated from A&M uh -huh. the few years before, but when working one year in other before, things. Yeah, oh, just, just Most after one year. Most of them took other jobs and stuff, you know. Yeah. But I said, my, my friend Allgood, he just, he had been out a year or two, but so he was ready to go. And so then he wanted to do that. He was good at it. He was a brilliant young man. Is that your friend who was doing yeah. food food science and yeah. things like doing? Yeah. yeah. He was a brilliant young man. He'd known, we'd known each other in college a little bit. We hadn't been real close or anything because he was all sort of doing different living standards than what I was. And uh, he was, uh, but anyway, you know, I never regret that I made that decision because that's what really, if it hadn't been for that and I hadn't gone to Boy City, Oklahoma, and I had not met Pat Robinson and she had got impregnated and I married her so that we would have children, then it all, it all works. And, uh, and today, that's why I'm here today is because all of that stuff, you look back on it now and see why why it all happened and it was all oh, because Heavenly Father was taking care of you. Yeah. You just gotta believe that. Well and you you had a, I mean you had a lot more examples of how your life fit together than just that, I think, moving yeah. forward. I'm I'm curious right before we come back to yeah sort of how that moved from your time moving back to Purcell, what since the soil conservation office just started. Uh huh. What was your job? Like, what, what what were you all doing? What was okay, the work? Okay, what I did, we had aerial photographs of every piece of ground in Cimarron County. So we went out and did it by sections, 640 sections. And then we would walk over that ground and we would determine the type of soil that was in that. And then we drew lines on that map of the soil that deal. And, we, and so we had names and stuff for every piece of soil that it, there is. You know, whether it's Renfro or Caliche or whatever, you know, it's all different kinds. And so we mapped that soil because that would give production information to the soil, the, the ASC office then who's going to pay people to farm, you know, for soils and the kind of, what kind of, uh, nutrients you had to put into that soil in order for it to grow wheat or and it was dry land farming see that out in the pan now and uh we we would we it later introduced irrigation you know which about that but we knew president eisenhower had hired ezra Taft benson to be the secretary of agriculture and he was a great agriculture man had 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 his doctorate degree and everything from out at in at University of Utah, in Utah State University rather, 
but he knew what he was doing. And so that's why he formed, they got the Congress to devote money to run these programs to map all the soils in the United States so that it would be productive because this had gone on in Israel in other parts of the world mapping soils and Ralph Murphy who was our boss had been around the whole world mapping soils and he knew soils like no other man in the world because a soil has certain depths and it has all different zones in it and you, you, you dig holes and you make sure but nowadays it's all computerized but then days it was a shovel and a probe you know and but we were the guys that invented all of this what we have today and it was and that was what was so fun was that we were traveling around in pickup trucks mapping soils by county by county by county going all over the state of Oklahoma and that's what my my friend finally he did that all of his life he Your did friend, it for the next 40 years did I hear his name right Almond all good. All good. Yeah, Ferris P. All good. Oh, it's his last name. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> Ferris P. All good. He got his Ph.D. from Oklahoma State University. All right. In soil morphology. Huh. So, and he did that for a long time afterwards. He made a career oh, yeah. of it. He made a career until he, he, he worked at it until he was 60 years old or more. Mm -hmm. Long and, time. And so now he retired from the Soil Conservation Service, but I beat him a long ways by retiring from the military. As a lieutenant colonel. In 1980. He, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he, so so it, it's all interesting how that it it is. works. Yeah, it is. And I, I wonder if there was a significance on why you all were centered out in the panhandle. Was did that That's where any, it started from. Well, that's where the office started from. But, but it, no, that's where the soil, the, the, they picked out the soil in Cimarron County and Beaver County and Texas County all the way across there. And so that was the beginning while the Department of Agriculture decided that was a good place to start it. Did that have anything to do with the Dust Bowl then? Yeah. All of that? Yeah. Trying to... I'm sure it was. Yeah, I just... Yeah, it I was mean, all connected. The assumption is easy to make. I just didn't yeah, know if there was any clear... Is. Yeah, because we even had some traces of the Dust Bowl and we even had some Dust Bowl targets that we changed the way the soil was protected with cover crops and all of this kind of stuff. And uh, that was not available in the 1930s when it all blew away. Right. Yeah. But we saw all the effects of that. That were still lingering. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it was programs like this friend of mine, he, he was there in the 30s. And then when it was... And he was a boy. My my mother in law grew up in the Dust Bowl. She knew had seen all of it from the time when they had to have wet sheets over the windows so I could breathe and everything like that. She was born there in Cimarron County. Your mother was? Mother in law. Oh your mother in law, right. Yeah. I past mother. Yeah, right. past mother. Right. And so that was a connection that was sort of interesting. But Anyway, it's all part of, I always bring it back, it was part of Heavenly Father's plan to save the soil for man to live on so we can have soil today and grow crops. And now agriculture is just plumb out, it's gone. When you see what the machinery and every stuff that does, and that right now we have less farmers, but we cover more ground than any other thing in the world. So what you're saying is that's a huge advancement just beyond yeah, thought just beyond it, that that was so far ahead of what anybody thought about in 1950 where it would be at 70 years later yeah and to be able to live through this and see it to what has happened is just that is this it's a it's a miracle that yeah. you're able to live through all of this time and and know that you were part of what made something happen in today's deal. Yeah, that is pretty Agriculture cool. is great. You know, and you grew up in it. My dad was a great, he liked machinery. He, he, he had started out with thrashing machines and stuff like that. Then he wound up with Alice Chalmers building a little combine so he could 
you know, he, he, did, he believed in all of that progression for machinery because Grandpa Fisher, my grandfather, was a mule man. He thought that only mules was any good to farm with. And my dad sold every mule in the world to get, rid, get tractors into the hands of people in the 30s. So he helped people convert from mule la from yeah, animal right, labor to machinery. Right here in Purcell, Oklahoma. Yeah. In 1939. Was that he, his first business? No, he was in electrical business and stuff like that. He was a mechanic. He was he was a, he was an electrical man. He, he even built radios and sold them to Indians and stuff. He did all kinds of stuff because he had gone to school at the Ray Automobile School to learn about electricity and his electrical experience. He could make radios, he could sell radios, he could build ma starters, generators, any magnetos, everything that there was about electricity for the farm work as well as the regular work, yeah. Did you pick up some of that? A little bit, yeah, yeah. but my grand, my oldest son is expert at that. He, he inherited all that characteristic. Is your oldest son named for your... His, his grandpa. His grandpa, yeah. yeah. So your dad? Uh, Dad was Lewis Fishburne, and my oldest son was Talmore Fishburne, named after his grandfather, oh, my grandfather. Oh, your grandfather, yeah. 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 I, I thought you said that somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Um, so after after you um, collected a wife, you mm -hmm. moved back to Purcell. Yeah. So um, you you mentioned a little bit about that that you had um, purchased a business or went into business. Yeah, I did. I had a. Mo my, there was a man, and my dad knew a lot of people because he'd been here all, for years. And so there was a guy asking him if, you know, he said, Ron, I could get you a motor freight business. And we used a building down here in Purcell that dad owns, you know, we owned, all, owned a bit, bit nice business, so we built a deck on it. And so I came back, I'd been making $300 a month. At, at, at the soil conservation business, that was my salary, it was $3,600 a year. And so I came back to Purcell and I could make as much money hauling freight in my pickup as I did then. I could make $300 a month. And then uh, I was in the Army Reserves, I was second lieutenant, and I could make money by joint, the reserve building was right here where we're sitting right now. Here in, the, in your this, shop? Yeah, yeah. This is right in this building. It, we, the officers wasn't like this or anything because I've read that all that. But, but anyway, this was where I had my business, and uh, and so Army Reserve. So that paid me about fifty dollars a month or something like that. You know, so people, money like that helped out. And uh, and I drilled and and uh, went to Fort Sill to train some and different things. I was in a unit right here in Purcell come down every Tuesday night and drill. Make about 10 bucks or something like that. Yeah. So you did that on top of? Being a freight man. And then I did a selling and trading anything I could do. You know, if, I, if I could buy an old tractor and fix it up and sell it, make it all, that's all right. Or I could trade anything. You know, but it was, it was a fun job. Yeah. And uh, so started raising children on that type of income. Then one day, sitting right here in this building, my reserve sergeant come by and said, would you like to fly airplanes? I said, oh, man, would I? <laughs> they said, well, we got an opening coming up for a helicopter pilot. And I said, where do I sign? <laughs> so the summer of 1960, I spent all that summer doing physicals, taking tests, examinations, and everything to try to pass everything. I could pass the physical all right. That was all, no problem with that. And then, but I had to, in it. so then I was qualified to be an aviator. Go to flight school at Fort Rucker, Alabama. So I, that's what, that's where I traded, quit my motor freight agency, gave that away. Just gave it to a guy, of course he ruined it, I mean he quit within six months, he didn't last. It was too much work. <clears throat> but anyway, I was off to flight school, left my wife and children right here in Purcell, 
we had two little boys, Tall and Brett. And so Pat stayed in the old big house. And uh, so I went down there because I wanted to go down and, and fly, make sure I soloed so that I could uh, know that I was going to stay in the program because they'd washed out 50% of the people got washed out. And uh, so sure enough, I, all, I thought I was just going to be, I mean, I kept, we had, they had a new kind of program, a new kind of airplane. and But anyway, my instructor was really a good Oklahoma guy that liked me. And so he went, he got me through the program to solo. The one that was in Alabama? Yeah. Yeah. He was from Oklahoma? He'd been born and raised right here. He was at World War II fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. You know, and that we had all those old guys that were teaching us, young guys, and that's back in 1960, 61. What did your wife think about it when you told her, I'm going to give up this really strong paycheck and then move towards this other thing? Said she was with me all the way. Never derived one. And that's what she never, never said that, you know, I couldn't do it. I had so many of my friends' wives who told them they couldn't fly, they couldn't do this, they couldn't go to war, they couldn't do anything. But she knew that the main thing was to have a happy husband. Was she a happy wife? Yeah. She was the best wife in the world. Turned out 49 years of just we, you know, we did, and she always went with me. You know, we lived all over the United States. We'd stay a year, two, and one, three, whatever. But we joined the Mormon Church, and that was what was the catalyst that made our life so good. Well, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think you mentioned that you all you joined the Mormon Church in 1963. Yeah. So that was after you were flying. It was after you had really gone full-time in the military, correct? Yeah. I'd already graduated from flight school. We'd be in the Methodist Church during that time. And I arrived at Fort Carson, Colorado in 1963, 62 actually. And I got a two-year assignment in the military to do more flying. And that's what I wanted to do because I needed to get more hours, more time. Didn't realize there would be a war come along. You know, that was not in the future, at least for me anyway. I hadn't thought about that. Well, this was on the tail of the Korean. Yeah, right after Korea, see. And so then we were had advisors going over to Southeast Asia. And uh, so, but anyway, I wasn't worried about that. I was just wanting to be in the military flying helicopters. And so that's what I got a job doing, that they assigned me to the 5th Mech Division in Fort Carson, so I, and then I was in an air cavalry unit that we had helicopters we could fly, but they're very primitive, so primitive that we we had to almost make believe we were doing what we were doing. <laughs> How is that? It's really interesting. But I got to fly the little baby helicopters, eight little two-place helicopters, and then all over Colorado, and uh, but that was gaining experience, you know. And that was what you wanted to do, was to learn. And we'd go out and chase coyotes and do things, you know, and have fun. So yeah. you went from school in Alabama? Yeah, and back here to... See, I went through the L-19 bird dog. I went through fixed wing first in, in Alabama. And I got back to Purcell. And I, I didn't have a job, so I was working part-time for a company up in Norman for a little while, awaiting orders to go to chopper school down at Fort Walters, Texas. And so I didn't get to Fort Walters until about January, because I'd got back out here about October, November. And so they had that little break in it, and so we just lived in the old big house, and, and I worked just to make enough money to buy beans and taters and stuff. But, and uh, anyway, then I got orders to go to Fort Walters, Texas. So I was back making money again, because as a lieutenant on flight status, I was making $600 a month, which at that time was a good money. Yeah, going from $300 a month to $600 a month. So then, so it all worked out, and so then I was at Fort Walters, in Fort 
Walters graduated from there in sixty in sixty two time frame. It was only down there about a, less than a year, about a year, yes, or two years. And then I applied for active duty to go back in the military permanently, or to some degree permanent. And so I did that. My reserve guys helped me do that. So I got back on active duty, and so that's why I went to Fort Carson then, because I was we had a two-year assignment in the military. And so that was going to be a good deal. Cause I, and then uh, when I got that going, and then we moved to Colorado, and then after one year, then they came along with this program of being an advisor going to Vietnam. They didn't call it Vietnam, they just said Southeast Asia. Yeah. To help the forces over there with flying helicopters. We're going to fly the H-21 flying banana. Uh, it's a twin-engine, big old airplane, 88 foot long. And anyway, it was being used there a lot because it had come out of the military surplus thing. And uh, so, but they said, you got to be qualified in a bigger helicopter. So they invented the Huey, the A model Huey. We had one of them at Fort Carson, Colorado. And so they let me get 25 hours with an instructor in that Huey before I went to. So anyway, then I got that 25 hours. So then they said, okay, now you got to go to Fort Rucker and get the H-21 rating. And so I went down there that summer and uh, got that rating, in which I, I love to fly it. It was really a big old bird. And so then I had orders to go to Southeast Asia. And uh, we knew the war. So my wife said she had been baptized in the Mormon church. And she said, before you go to combat, you ought to get baptized. Because that make me feel better. And because you're going off to war to because she was really sold on the Latter-day Saint Church. And I said, okay, I'll do it to experiment with it to see if that's really what we think it is. We thought it was really going to be an excellent church to raise our family in. <clears throat> so anyway, it all worked out. And uh, so I went off to Vietnam and just been baptized in 63, in April the 6th of 63. And I got to Vietnam in the summer of 63. And that's when I got assigned to fly dust off helicopters, medevac. They had, had, had five helicopters in Vietnam at that time. And I said, so they needed 10 pilots, they had nine. And I was number 10. General Stillwell said, you'll go over to the medevac bunch and fly. I said, that's okay, D. Is that what you thought you were going to do? No, I had no idea I was going to do that. What did you think you were going to do? When Just fly the old H-21s, hauling troops around. Mm -hmm. So this was an exciting project because you were going out and rescuing people that had been shot up or shot down or what that. You know, Medivac was like the MASH hospital. It was, and out of what we were assigned to, a MASH hospital, just like the one that you watched on TV. It's just like that. It's really real. Really? And so I got to fly with some guys checking me out in the situation of flying in combat, getting shot at the first one they know. But anyway, my buddy, Bill Scanlon, was an old Marine guy. <clears throat> so I was flying with him. And so he let me, he, he was an expert at flying the helicopter. So I got to learn really well from him. And that was really a neat experience. And I survived. And I quit. I only got to fly dust off for six months. Then I went to gunships up at Pleiku for another six months, uh, commanding a, a platoon of assault gunships, helicopters. We'd put guns on helicopters. That didn't have the Cobras or any of that kind of stuff back in the We were inventing all that kind of stuff. And so we went out and had fun covering the guys that were putting troops on the ground and we would cover them with fire support around them, you know, so it keep the bad guys, their heads knocked down or something like that.
So it was interesting to do all of that and made it. So you were over there a year, is that right? Yeah, one year. Didn't see the family for a year. Mm -hmm. But I talked to them, you didn't talk to them on the telephone, but I was talking to my mother the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I was in a hotel in Saigon on leave what was getting a helicopter worked on, and I, and I was able to patch through on a patch line with the civilian radio guys that could do that. And I was talking to my mother, and she said, I'm just watching. John F. Kennedy's just been killed. And I was one of the first guys in Vietnam to hear that he'd been assassinated. Oh, gosh, how'd you feel about that? Well, I, you knew it was going to happen. I mean, you know, you know, I thought, well, that's sad, but... You know, I mean, it doesn't stop the war. No. You just keep on going, John F. Then Lyndon B. Johnson became the president immediately. Mm -hmm. So when I got home and said, and at the end of that tour, that I, and Lyndon B. Johnson was president. Right. Kennedy's dead. And then we started the real Vietnam War. So, yeah, you were there on the really early years. Yeah, very first of it, yeah. I stayed to the very last. Well, explain to me that. So you went over in 63, uh -huh. came back in 64. Yeah. So you saw that there was turmoil, right? So you yeah. knew. It was that... Um, yeah, I became an instructor pilot for, to train the war officers. So I spent... If I wasn't in Vietnam... I was training people to go to Vietnam, so I did that for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I went back, I went to Command General Staff College in 71, Yeah. And uh, which is a, really a select college for Army officers. And uh, I didn't like it, but it was, it was, you had to do it in order to be promoted. I was a major in the Army at that time, and I was, I didn't think I'd ever make Lieutenant Colonel, but I went to that school, and then out of that school, they picked 10 majors to command air cab troops in Vietnam in 72. And that was the epitome of what I'd always wanted to do was command an air cavalry troop in combat. Really? What and made you want to do that? Like, because I've been trained to do that. And you always want to command because you'll have three or four hundred kids working for you. And you want to go out and, and whoop up on the bad guys. You know, you want to be a successful leader. It's teaching leadership is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I got to do and that was what I liked because I wanted to be the epitome of leadership in, in the air cavalry business, mm -hmm. which went on now is just it's worldwide. But. That was the beginning of it all. So from 64 until, well, for the next decade, you you were an instructor of some sort and moving up the military ranks at the yeah. same time. So where did, where did you, um, when you came back, did you come back to Colorado? No, I came back. Uh, I had left Fort Rucker as an, in, as an instructor. So when I came back, I came back to Mineral Wells, Texas to the primary flight, helicopter flight school there to teach warrant officers how to fly basic helicopters. And so I was a platoon leader, <clears throat> chief of, of operation and stuff, and teaching flying, and I was flying, and I had students that I taught how to fly and stuff like that. Were there things that you learned that made your experience unique having spent a year in Vietnam by that point? Yeah. So, do you remember what some of those, some of the things that you were able to share were? Like what were some of the points that you made sure to tell the students you were training that would probably go on to that? Yeah, it's, you know, what, what I learned to do was that I had a, an ability to fly with young pilots that wanting to be pilots to make a determination if they were fit and if they could cut the mustard on being a combat pilot. Because my instructors sometimes would give up on guys 
and they'd say, I don't think, sir, I don't think he's going to be able to make it. So whenever they had those kind of people, then I said, well, let me fly with them. I want to check them. I want to see if we can teach them how to fly good enough that they can do that. And so then as a leader, then I would talk to them and I'd tell them, you know, that, you know, how do you, you got to be a leader. You got to be able to understand people and do things. And so that's what I did. I had that ability to teach leadership. Mm -hmm. And my guys made it. There was uh, two people that I worried about, and they were two warrant officers. One was named Nut, and the other was named Noosebaum. And we had worked and worked trying to get them certified, and I thought that if they were flying with, if Nut was flying with a pretty good pilot, for a Noosebaum flying a pretty good pilot, it'd probably be all right. Well, anyway, when they went into the uh, other phase of training, then because they had two ends, Nut and Noose Bomb, then the next bunch of guys put them together in the same airplane, and they flew it in the ground. Killed them. And that's something you could, you uh, knew. You always remembered, yeah. It was a bad situation. Yeah, that, that, I never, you know, I didn't think they were, I didn't trust them as an in, as that, you know, the two of them together would have been, I never dreamed about that happening. But it just happens, and uh, so you learn to do that. You have to deal with death in helicopters and airplanes. And, you know, they make mistakes. You kill them. Mm -hmm. But you're trying to train them to where they're good enough that they won't. But sometimes they just get too excited and uh, we were training them down at Fort Walters, Texas. And I remember one night, this Cracker Jack warrant officer, he thought he could fly low level at night. He flew right into the high line waters and killed him. Just come apart. Just stuff like that, you know. But if you hope that they will be smart enough, because there's no such thing as an old, bold pilot. There's old pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. They're all dead. And that's what I always taught them. You can't monkey around with something like that because it'll kill you. And that's you, what I teach my kids. Did you have to learn that yourself, or did yeah. somebody teach it to I, you? I, I learned it. You learn all of that by doing it. Mm -hmm. That's what makes, you know, but it's a, it's a background because I'm a little bit older than everybody because I well, I'd been in the reserves and stuff. So I was a, an older lieutenant than most lieutenants were. And then I was an older captain. I stayed a captain for eight years. Or major, I guess it was, for eight years. But anyway, maturity, and that makes you safer. Do you think that it made a difference that by the time you started flying, you already had a wife and two kids at home? Yeah. That's a big, better deal because they're very important. A family, because you want to live to raise your family. So I never took a lot of the chances. I probably took chances, but they were calibrated chances, you know. And I never, I never dreamed about dying. I mean, I was always knew that I could handle it, even though I had some close calls. I knew that the good Lord was on my side. Was, I think that's interesting because it was so, so close from the time that you decided to get baptized in the Mormon church. So it's not, that was a big faith decision. Yeah. To the time that you left for mm -hmm. something that was really dangerous yeah. for a year. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you said was that when you decided to get baptized, it was your wife had made the decision for herself, and you thought you'd try it and see how it fits you. Yeah. So how were you able to make the decision of whether it fit when you were a really far away away from most because Mormon churches? Because I just I had faith. <clears throat> you got to have faith. I think is a key element, and uh, things happened that I was still alive and that 
you know, that, that I had been spared. So when I, after one year of flying combat and coming back to San Francisco and landing on American soil, because we hadn't been able to even let anybody know we were Americans in Southeast Asia, that didn't wear a flag or anything like that, you know. Is that because it wasn't official yet wasn't that the official. U.S. was involved? And so to come back to, back to good old San Francisco, and then I said, Heavenly Father, there must be a plan. And so then that's when I told my wife, I said, I believe the church is real. It's true. It's got some, it's got some things we want to work with for the rest of our life. And I thought that, and then I exemplified it by the fact that I just, I changed my whole lifestyle of what, you know, I was no more smoking or drinking or any, you know, I quit of what we call the live the word of wisdom. And it, it works. So once I started all of that and the kids started to grow it, then I got involved in Boy Scouts and, you know, I wanted to raise my boys to all be great Americans. And, you know, and so the military fit me. It was what I wanted to do. I loved it. And when you love a job, you want to stay with it forever. You never quit. Did you have that same passion for it when you were just in the reserves? Not, well, in the reserves, I loved to fly because I was different than anybody else. How's that? Well, I could fly. Nobody else could do that. <laughs> because you were in the reserves and could fly. Yeah. yeah. See, I had, an, I had a helicopter that I could get from the reserve unit and fly down here to Purcell and land in my backyard. Did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> and that I really, can't even imagine that. <laughs> but that really impressed my, my neighbor who was in bed sick because she had a stroke. And so when I took off, I flew right over her house. And she said, oh, Ron, that is so great. You did that just for me, didn't you? <laughs> so I can see it. Stuff like that, you know. And I still give airplane rides to people. But just the other day, I took a little boy. He wanted to go fly so bad in my little airplane. and so. Do you keep one hangered around here? Yeah. So he came down. His grandpa brought him down. And his mom came along and his grandma. So I took him for a ride all around in the little 150. And we landed, and then the grandpa would come over and said, well, my daughter has never got to ride in one of those. Would you let her ride too? And I said, yeah, I'll get in. So I took her for a ride around the area. But you know, people enjoy doing things that they never get to do in their life. Never had those two people ever been in an airplane. Had you ever flown before you took up the offer? No. Never. How'd you know you were going to like to do it? I don't know. My brother was flying. He liked it. Your younger brother was flying? Flying for the point? Navy, yeah. yeah. And I just always, because we'd watch those old airplanes take off and land up at Goldsby when I was a little kid. And I thought, you know, that would be... And I had rode in an airplane in the 1930s, uh, at Norman there, there was a, an air show there of some sort, an old tr Ford Trimotor. My dad took me for a ride in the airplane and thought that was pretty neat, you know. We got to fly and we, we thought the little cars were what we wanted. And that was what this little nine-year-old boy told me when we got back. He said, oh, I want to get some of them little cars that were running around on the ground. It's yeah. true. But you know, but I, you know, I get to, I get to help people a lot. And this friend of mine that ran the grocery store up here, why, his son and his friend had been over to Ada and they coming back from Ada one night where they ran off a road and hit the big deal and killed both of them. And uh, they couldn't find them. They didn't know where they were at or anything. And uh, this one boy who worked there, even assistant manager, where well, his wife said, woke him up at one o'clock in the morning, says, I just had a vision. 
says, call Ron Fishburne right now and says he can find that crash site. And so he, he called me and I said, he called me right about midnight, a little one o'clock. And I said, yeah, we can do that. I said, meet me at the airport at daylight in the morning and we'll search. I took off from the airport at Purcell at daylight. I flew directly to the crash site and there was the pickup in the ditch that they had driven into. So you and just killed you were both able of them to were see sitting it. there. They were, both bodies were in the pickup. So things like that let you know that somebody talks to you. And you can do even found a, a guy had lost his old cow was down in the river. She was having a baby calf. And he said, Ron, I said, could you take us flying on the river so we can find the old cow? She's having a baby. So we went out and flew the river, found the old cow where she was in the woods. Because well, he couldn't get to it on a horse searching because he couldn't see through the bushes. So then he went back, took him back to the airport. And he got in his pickup, went over and got in a, on his old horse and went out there and brought the old cow in with the baby. So things like that is makes you have you have talents to do that nobody else can do because you have the piece you have the ability to fly. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what is so fun. <laughs> and you're still doing it. Yeah, still doing it. Well, so I know that you retired out of the military in 1980. So you you went to. What was the school that you went to in 71 or 72 that you said you didn't want to do? Or Command Jail Staff College. So why didn't you think you were going to like it? Why didn't you Well, like it was it? work. It wasn't flying. <laughs> you know, it's school work. Mm -hmm. But you had to do it in order to be promoted, you know. I mean, it was one of those deals. But I enjoyed it because I was a scout leader and I did a lot of other fun things with the family. So it was a family deal. and. I got to be with them before, and then I was chosen to go back to Vietnam out of that school. So, oh, so then they all said, "Well, where are we going to live?" And I said, "Well, my boys are about high school age. The two oldest were tall and red." And I said, "I think we better go to Utah. I want to serve it." I said, "I can get a job out there." when I get back from Vietnam as an ROTC instructor. And that way the boys can, can do church, what they call, it's a, it's a release time church program that you can do while you're in high school, when you're in a big, and when you're in the Utah country where all the Mormons are. So that's what I did, it worked. So you moved and moved the family to Utah because yeah, you... Yeah, bought a house in Utah. Yeah? Yeah. Bought a house in Utah and I went to Vietnam and Pat stayed there with five, six kids. Brave woman. Boy, she's tough. <laughs> it was the coldest winter that had ever happened in Cache Valley, Utah. Went to 50 below zero. It froze the water pipes in the ground. And I got, a, I took leave, and this was in 72. So they let me have some leave to come home. And uh, when I was commanding the air cab troop at Play Coup, and so I got home and everything froze to the ground. I mean, so I spent the next 10 days, you know, getting, getting everything, put heat back in the house that was good enough to keep it all from freezing and everything. And so then, uh, so they said, okay, the war is going to be over. So I called them and I said, do you want me to come back? And they said, yeah, come back and stand down the company, the troop. So I got on the airplane and flew back to, to uh, Vietnam and got there and uh, stood down, give all the stuff back to the bad guys and everything, closed down my office, my, everything that I had. And I started to leave Vietnam. I had to hitchhike a ride on a v VC airplane 
I got down to Saigon and I was still trusting people and uh, so the, the kid that a Vietnamese offered me a ride back down to where my headquarters would be. So he was being so nice I decided I'd get out of the he yeah, I said, let me off right here at the PX and I'll get you some stuff out of it. Well, as soon as I got out of the Jeep but had all my stuff in it, he drove off. He took everything I had. All I had was what I had on me, just my, my flight suit. And I never did find that. Lost everything, my records, my everything that I had wanted to take back home mm -hmm. to Oklahoma. Walking out the door. Yep, so I gave all of that to the VidCon. And uh, anyway, it all worked out though, so I got back to Utah. And so they hot let me stay on in, as an instructor at the university. So I did that until finally had to, <clears throat> to get orders to get at, to, to move. But they only let me stay there, I guess, four years. And so I said, well, where are you going to send me? And I talked to my people, up, and they said, I don't know. We don't know. I kept calling up there, and finally, the uh, little old gal that answered the phone, she was a, I don't know, she might have been the cleaning lady there or something. She looked on the desk and said, well, it looks like they're going to send you to Fort Knox, Kentucky. I said, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And I said, I don't want to go there, not as a staff officer. And so anyway, I weaseled around. I said, I want to go to the Defense Information School at Fort or by Indianapolis so I could become a, a person who's involved in advertising and public affairs and all that stuff. And they finally let me do it. I tried to get them to give me, let me get a master's degree at the university on you know, that stuff. But nah, they, nah, it cost too much money. I wouldn't do that. So anyway, though, I went down there. Then I had to take a little staff job as a lieutenant colonel and uh, in, the, uh, in a brigade. And it was just sort of a muffy job. And, but anyway, I did. I, did it when I was over there to the ROTC headquarters talking to the general, saying I want out of this mess I'm in. And uh, so my friend, he was head of the advertising and public affairs for ROTC for that region. He said, I'm going to retire. And I said, OK, I want your job. And so I went over and convinced the old general that I needed that job. So we made, pulled some strings. I got the job for another two years by staying at Fort Knox. They wanted to ship me off to Korea or somewhere or another as an unassigned deal. Don't want to do that. Why did they want to send you to Korea? Oh, it's just, it, it, they don't have any spots for lieutenant colonels. Mm -hmm. And you know, they had one there, so they just, they just want to get rid of you. And so I said, well, I, you just, and I, in my mind, I said, okay. And they said, oh, okay, finally they agreed. The general, he wrote a good letter on me said, no, I want him over here. And so anyway, I did. So I spent that two years. And then then they came up wanting to still run me off somewhere. And I said, that's the easy way. I'll just retire. Because I had my 27 years in. Yeah. I had 26 years. So retired in 1980, right? Yep. 1980. Um, Got it back here. And came, back to, came back to Purcell. Yep. Um, I have one question about that, and then I think we can okay. come back to um so i think I think this is really interesting and significant because you were at the beginning uh -huh. of Vietnam before it was Vietnam, like and you were at the very end you have to close yeah. it out yeah what's the inside i mean there there's got there's that whole time period you saw it all. From one perspective or another, I'm just curious. My perspective is it was a job well done. I didn't mind it at all. I have no regrets. I think I did more good with people, with young soldiers, young aviators, young people. And as a commander, I was able to influence people for good. Whereas I was not a renegade type bar hopping 
person, but I was, and to prove that, which it identified that this one young warrant officer that flew for me, and he was a he was a bright young man. He was just out of college. He wasn't anything. He was even out of college. But then he had taken a lot of pictures of our operation, and so he dis he went on back home. He got out of the military, went back and joined the reserve forces in Wisconsin or somewhere up in there. And uh, so we never talked to each other again. That was, you know, 30 years later before he discovered through the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association that Ron Fishburne was still alive, living in Purcell, Oklahoma. And he couldn't resist to give me a call and check in with me. And he had gone on to the reserves and he had, he had flew for the Air Force and made in reserve deal and he'd made current one everything but he'd really done well and then he was so tickled and then he sent me a picture of me walking down to a meeting in play coup and he said ron you're the you're the greatest leader i've ever had and you know whenever you have a young guy that grows up goes up and said, you're the best commander that I ever worked for in my life. And I said, you know, I didn't ask for anything. I was just doing the best I could. And it sounds like you recognized that was a skill you had. Yeah, and it was. And it was tried a leadership to develop skill. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did that with all of, even after all of this, I, my leadership skills then continued on. Yeah, so when you came back to Purcell, your family voted to come back to the big barn. Yeah. So you moved back to Purcell out of all the, all the options you had. Yep. And you know why I came back here? Mm -mm. Because I had a bit more landed here than the mayor said, Ron, would you be, serve on the city council? <laughs> so you walked back in the town doors and you were already, already, already. tapped back in. Yeah. Well, and you had, you know, you had family. Your yeah. your dad was, I think, a pretty strong businessman oh, yeah, in the area as well. But they knew old Ron Fishburne is the hero of Purcell, militarily wise. Did they keep up with your military record pretty oh, well? Oh yeah, they, they was in the newspaper all the time. My mother was always bragging about me. You know, every time I'd come back from Vietnam, I'd give talks and tours and. Yeah. Stuff about war, and helicopters and stuff. So even just coming back to visit your yeah. parents? Yeah, come back and leave, yeah. People knew. Yeah. So you came back, you joined the city council. You um, you did some other stuff, too. Oh, yeah, I did everything. <laughs> you joined back in the business world. Yeah, I come back in the business world, went to real estate school with red carpet, got my real estate license because... My brother was in the real estate business in Norman, running a program up there, and so I thought, well, that's probably not a bad idea because Mary Wilson, who had the red carpet real estate company in Purcell, and she said, Ron, I said, I'll, you get free training. I mean, yeah, all school. So I took the red carpet course and got my real estate license. And uh, so that was a start, and she, and so I went to work with her, and they were also nice to me. They let me sell stuff. It was hard, but they helped me, you know, through all the deals. So it was a, it was a good deal, and I, I did pretty good. But I never made a lot of money out of it. But it was sort of a fun deal. And uh, you did it for thirty years, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I helped a lot of people. You know, that's what it's all about, yeah. taking care of your little old town. What all do you see in town right now? You see the the new water system, the new police and fire station, and all of that is from my foresight that I would need. So when I got here in 1980, we didn't have any electricity. Every time you turn on your electric, it's liable to go out because United up there would burn all the electricity and the lines were all weak. Town would go into darkness. 
And so, you know, but, and the water wasn't any good. And I knew we need a new water system, we need a new sewer system, we need a new electrical system. We did all of that. And so, anyway, I served on the city council for about a year or two. And then you had to run for office. And uh, so I said, well, I might as well, because they appointed me to be this job. So I ran, and there's another guy in town that was real favorite. So he he just smoked my chili. I mean, you know, I didn't even have a chance. I mean, he, he was... He was he was almost voted in by acclamation by the people, you know, J. C. Miller. And uh, so anyway, they suffered, the city then suffered through all of that for the next three or four years. And then one day, a group of citizens came and said, "Ron, I said, what? Would you run for city council? Because you had to be a Democrat to run." It, 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 there's no Republicans allowed to run, and I wasn't a I wasn't anything. And so anyway, I said, and they said, well, you and Don Woolley, would you run to get this city back on its feet going in the right direction? And we said, well, I will if you'll vote for me. But I said, you've got to vote, because uh, these old guys that are on there, that they don't want to change anything. And I said, we need all this change. And so some of them changed from Republican to Democrat so they could even vote in the city election. Because I said, if we get elected, if Don and I get elected, we will make this a nonpartisan election from now on. We'll go back just like what the school board is. And so we ran and we smoked their chilies. <laughs> we were put in. I never had another opponent for 15 years. You stayed in that long? Yeah. Stayed in actually a total of 18 years. Mm -hmm. So how did you get all that, that change affected? It's it's obvious, I will tell you. You, you drive into town, you see it. It's Yeah. Well, you just start working on it. And all the people wanted to do it. The city council, we had good city managers. We had good people thinking good, positive things. And we just kept working. We got a wa we got the water deal done over in the... And it was all, we just, you know, you just got to tell people what you want. You got to have vision. You got to say, okay, we want this and this and this and this. And then uh, first they say you're crazy. And then once, it's just like uh, a guy gave us uh, an old caboose from the railroad, Santa Fe Railroad. And I was, I was thinking that, you know, and they said, well, we're just going to pull it off down to the junkyard. And I said, oh. I said, we need to pay respect to the Santa Fe people. Let's make a Santa Fe plaza on Main Street. <clears throat> so I said, we'll put the caboose up here on Main Street. We'll block off this one street right next to the Love Hotel, which is a very historic building. And uh, we'll put all this in there and we'll make a Santa Fe Plaza, and they said, Ron, you're crazy, you're, you're nuts, you know, you can't do that, nobody will let you close down the street. I said, watch, 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 we close it down, push that, put some railroad track down up there on that main street, and put that caboose on there. And we brought in some, in that time, the desert storm was going on, so the people had gone to that. We made a monument to put out for them. We made a monument there for the family that gave the caboose. They'd been a great uh, people in the railroad. They even found an old Civil War monument that was laying out in the, in the graveyard out there that needed to be brought in and cleaned up, representing the history of all this country of Purcell. And, you know, and once it was all in, and they then uh, they, the first time a guy ran for governor, had him come down and sit, sat on the back of that caboose and talk. You know, and they said, we sure had a good idea, didn't we? <laughs> Stuff like that is where you do it. You know, some people said, we'll take a bulldozer and push that train, that thing on down the hill or something. Mm -hmm. But you know, the positive people, the guy that run the Love Hotel, he was just tickled to death. 
and you know you just sway people and show them that good things can happen. The uh, Purcell, we dreamed about uh, all the Purcell police and fire facilities and we knew that that had to be done sometime or another because it's living down here in a little bitty rat hole. So then they said that was Fishburne's folly by building all of that out there and getting the bonds and all the money together and stuff to build a fire station, police station that is top of the list, you know. And so anyway, they all still say, "Why well, was Fishburne's folly? He just wanted all that." But anyway, it all worked out. Whenever we had a really <coughs> <coughs> unusual murder in town of a little girl being put in a box and cut up and they found it and then that, that was when the national media came into Purcell to examine all of that and then they saw what a super police station and fire station we had and everything. Then they said, well Purcell's not just a little hillbilly town after all, is it? So what was the pushback from people who didn't think that that was a good use of their funds? Money. It all came down to money? Not yeah. because it wasn't needed. No, they just don't want you to spend anything. They want you to stay the same. They don't want to see growth and development. You got and to be on the city council, you got to be twenty years way ahead of everybody else. If you're not twenty years ahead, you're not going to get anywhere. Do you think you have a good representation now? Yeah, my son's on the city council. Well, good. You better say that. <laughs> Yeah, we have. We got some good guys on it now. We had to go through some times of real bad, very backward thinking people, is what I call it. Uh, where'd your kids land? Speaking of having, you know, one son's obviously here. He's on yeah, the he's council. going to law school. He's here. He's the OCU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Brett, number two son, is in Crum, Texas. He's uh, works for a uh, oil company that's uh, they buy it's a, it's not oil but it's propane or you know gas and uh, and he's he's been in that business ever since when when he got married and came to Purcell years ago and I got him a job working for a gas company in town reading meters and he has brought that all the way through. He put himself through OU by reading meters for the Lone Star Gas Company and uh, everything. And so he was able, then he was went into the Navy when he got graduated from OU. Then they sent him to the Naval Flight Program and uh, he got to, and he went through their program and made an ensign. And, uh, but he, then when he, started flying. He liked to fly, but there was a lot of other parts of it he didn't like. So, But he stayed in the Naval Reserves the rest of his life. And he got in his 20-some years in it, but he never did fly anymore. He flew about 120 hours or so, something like that. He got checked out, so did all this stuff. But he just, he was more interested in horses than he was in airplanes. But Brad is such a good guy. He raised four good children, and uh, uh, they're just, you know, that, so they lived down in Crum, Texas. He lived down in the Dallas area, and then he went on down to the Woodlands in Texas by Houston and worked for oil companies down, gas companies, always a natural gas guy. That's what he used all his life. Then Tall, the oldest boy, he was commissioned a second lieutenant out of the University of Utah. And uh, so he wanted to go in the military, but he couldn't get in because it was in the reserve status. So finally, I kept talking to some people in Washington. And finally, one day, I was talking to this lady up there, <clears throat> and I said, I got a son that wants to be an infantry officer really bad. He wants to come back on active. He wants to come on active duty because he's a reserve type guy. And so she said, I've got a slot. And so I called him on the phone and I said, Tall, 
and he was working on Volkswagens for an Audi dealer right then. I got him out in front of the old car, and I said, I can get you into Fort Benning, Georgia, to go to, to the basic officer training course there tomorrow. I said, would you like to go? He said, oh, yes, I want to go so bad. So anyway, sent him down there to go through that. And, and he came by here on his way. I loaned him my old pickup to drive down there. He ordered a pickup from a guy here in Purcell. And uh, so he went to Fort Benning and uh, went through the training down there to become a, uh, he was a second lieutenant, but they had to send him to a basic infantry officer course because he had been in another branch. And uh, so then he went through all of that and then went to Airborne Ranger stuff and all of that and then and, uh, got pneumonia while he was in Ranger school and then and almost died, but they got him with his lungs. He got pneumonia and stuff. But anyway, he finally went through, got through Ranger school. And then, of course, when he got through, by the time he got out of Fort Benning, they sent him to Alaska. And that was 1986. He's never left. And so his wife made him get out of the military. Of course, he divorced her then because she became ornery. And uh, so he was the kind of a guy that's about like me that never gave up. He always figured out a solution for everything. He was a very good mechanic. He worked for for Volkswagen and Audi and all of those guys. And so he always made a living. If he wasn't doing the job he was trained to do, he would work on the side. So anyway, he wound up uh, always kept getting more education. He got a master's degree in, in uh, technology and uh, from the University of Alaska. And then he was on a he was he was a tenured professor at the University of Alaska and they fired him. They closed down his business his department because they didn't have a room. And so the union said, oh, we can save you, we can save you. And I said, the unions can't save anybody. And so sure enough, they couldn't. So then he went to work, he had some friends over in another department of uh, working for the state of Alaska and training Eskimos how to run engines to make electricity out in little villages. And then he worked on that and made a lot of friends in the, in that electrical business through the state. And then one day, the guy running the Greens Creek Mill down in Juneau, which they were mining for silver and gold and lead and zinc, and they needed an electrician. And so they hired him to go down and run that program because he was an expert on running programs from the computer end of it, making electricity and everything. So he worked for them. They paid him 100000 a year, and they flew him back and forth. He worked two weeks down there and two weeks back home. And uh, so he got tired of that. His wife, he didn't have a wife, and his first wife had deserted everything, but he kept charge of the three girls. He never turned loose of them, even though they lived with their mother, so he he never gave up on them. And uh, so one day then, there's another company called him up, wanted to hire him. And so he said, well, I got to work for six digits. I don't work for any less than that. And uh, so he said, okay. And so then, but he got in with them and they were just starting up with him and they were different kinds of engineers. He was a mechanic. He was electrical engineer and they were mechanical engineers. And anyway, that didn't work. But then the opportunity came available in Anchorage to be working at, for the electrical department for the city of Anchorage. But the salary was about $20,000 lower than what he wanted to work for. And they said, go ahead and apply for the job. We'll take care of all that. 
So he went ahead and applied, and uh, they hired him and a superintendent of electricity for the city of Anchorage and for Palmer and another little town. First month, he got a $17,000 raise to get him back up to where he wanted to be. And he's there today, right now, and he's been there about two years now. He's had to rework the whole system of people, and that was what they were needing bad and the right people doing the right things. Mm -hmm. So leadership skills. So he's really happy. Found a good wife. Uh, he l married a lady that he had met rock climbing in the rock gym. She had never been married. And uh, she had been working for a project in the Arctic. She's a very good engineer. And, uh, you know, and she is brilliant. I mean, and she graduated from Cornell University and and uh, I don't know what it is. Anyway, it's all about math and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so she had taken some jobs around the world and she was running the whole computer system for the school system in Anchorage, Alaska. So she had been around the world and come back and he was over at the rock gym and he likes to climb rocks and met old Kathy over there and she still had never married. She was still a genius at school. Mm -hmm. And so Nita and I had got married and this was in 07. And uh, That's your current wife. Yeah, my current wife. And so we just got married. We hadn't told anybody. Whatever we did, we did the same you thing. You have a habit of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so Anyway, then Tall and Kathy got married and they hadn't told anybody. And so they called us and said, we just got married. But he married this boy. He did a good job on this one. She's a perfect angel. Good. So you got, that's three of your kids. You got a few other kids. Are they just around? You then, don't have to go okay, through their but, whole thing. I'm just wanting to know where they're at and what they're doing. But Tate, him, he, he went to the OSU's architecture school. He married there and married his classmate in that. And so when he graduated, he graduated ahead of Margaret. And so he went to work for down at Dallas because OSU has a real good program with the guys in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So he went down and worked for the company down there. And so when Margaret uh, graduated, she called Tate. Now they had been, they were just buddies. And she said, I'm going to Albuquerque. That's where we want to go to be architects. And uh, Tate said, okay. So anyway, she we moved her. I did, and we all moved her out to Albuquerque. They hadn't got married yet. And we got an apartment and everything. And uh, old Tate, he walked into the first place, an individual architect deal and they hired him on the spot. So they still well, in New he, Mexico? Yeah. And so he uh he's a he's brilliant too about architecture. But he was started out in engineering, but then he found out he was a better artist than he was an engineer and that he could see it all. He's a he's got a mind that he can visualize a building before it's ever even conceived. Mm -hmm. And he did so good up there at, at Stillwater in the Ar architect school. And so he's got a really good business in Corrales, New Mexico, right outside of Albuquerque. They built him a $750,000 home on a five-acre apple orchard that they paid a million dollars for almost. Yeah, wow. And uh, just unbelievable what they raised four children. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and there are private businesses went through a slump this last year, but it's all bounced back. It's uh, but Tate he stayed in the Army Reserves too for a long time, and uh, so he was a good military kid too. And then uh, uh, Leah, our daughter, <clears throat> she uh, was in Alaska. <clears throat> That's where she met Joe. She had been married to David Tompkins here in Purcell 
when she first got out of high school. And uh, so David had already been married once and he had one boy. And so anyway, they he was a good guy. He's still a good friend of mine. And we, we worked together a lot. But anyway, she was wanting to have babies and he didn't he he didn't want any babies. So I said, Well, we'll just get this divorce done. So I went out and saw an attorney. I said, Here's two hundred and fifty dollars. Give Lee and Joe uh, David a divorce. Okay. Of course she wants to go to college at OSU. And so anyway, that's what we did. Sent her and so she went up to OSU and was going to school there. And then one summer, uh, uh, the uh, the kids in Alaska, Paul and them, invited them all to come up. And so they all went to Alaska for the first time. And then while she was in Alaska, she met this uh, uh, kid, a really good guy, Joe Ballard. And he was a returned missionary. He seemed like a really good guy, and uh, this is, uh, so they got married, and they had that little baby there. That's a baby. <laughs> yeah, and then there's some more of them on the back side <laughs> of them, all kinds of babies. And anyway, they did really good uh, for a while, and then uh, it didn't work. And they're in the process right now of getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. Their oldest daughter is fixed to graduate from high school. And the second daughter is was a junior, I think. And then the third daughter, she's a barrel racer. She likes to race horses. And, but Leah has done a good job. But it's just been a sad case, you know, of what happens to people. And they don't get along. And I said, well, can't make it. Then here is... They're still in Alaska? No, she okay. lives at, so they I moved know. back to, to Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And Ben as Lee had been in Desert Storm, mm -hmm. she had the GI Bill. And so she used her GI Bill and bought a nice home in Rio Rancho. And Joe was working on the North Slope. He'd work up there two or three weeks and be home a week or two, back and forth. Well, there was a power struggle between Joe and Leah, because when Leah was running the home, then he would come home and want to run it. Yeah. And so that doesn't work. That's the worst thing you can do. If Joe would have been smart, he would have come back home and just walked in and said, great job, it's going good, just keep running the place. But no, he came in, he said, they can't do this, they can't do that, and they can't go out here, and can't do it. You know, put hard. all these rules down. <clears throat> yeah, that's hard. And it's tough. I don't know whether you've ever experienced that, but <laughs> well, if, if you do, you know what it is. Yeah. And so that's what's wind up as a divorce. So they're in New Mexico, and then they're you've got your other daughter. Now, this is Rhonda. Uh-huh. So she was going to OSU. Uh -huh. She took uh, all this course in uh, fashion design. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really did good in it and went to work and took her internship with an outfit down in Oklahoma City. And in this process, her boyfriend was Matt Evans, went to flight school and Enid. So he was always coming down, esquiring her around. And so they decided to get married. And uh, so they got married and uh, went in and he, so she went into the Air Force with him as an Air Force wife because he came down to take her flying AWACS planes. That was his first duty assignment. And so anyway, they started off really good. And so their first child was uh, this, this little baby there, little girl. She's grown up now just about. But anyway, they decided, you know, it's, he's going. He stayed in because that's what he wanted to be. He wanted to put a career in the Air Force and then go to work for Delta Airlines. And so he played that. He's a very smart guy. We come from a dysfunctional family. His mother and dad never lived together. But good guy. But hard working. I mean, money pension. I mean, he saved every penny. 
Are they still in Oklahoma then? No, now that so they they've traveled around the world. Went to Okinawa. They've been everywhere flying. And so all the time she was doing that, she used her degree. Like she was in Okinawa, then she worked for AFI's going to Korea to buy clothes and stuff and all this. So anyway then, so they do all of this, and she finally winds up, their final assignment is it, off at Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, which is the coldest place in the world to live. So anyway, she had got hitched up while they were living in Honolulu, because that's where he was flying out of there. And they'd bought a home in, in Oahu, and right down by the beach, and uh, well, pretty close, but now it's become closer to the beach because it's right all the roads there. But they made a good investment there in a nice home. And uh, anyway, she goes in with Ann Taylor, and now she become a manager running stores for Ann Taylor because of her expertise. She's very good at it, I mean. Yeah. And, but now, and so anyway, she did all of this, and so then. He gets out of the Air Force before he even gets out. Delta hires him. He just goes down to Atlanta and they sign him up to start flying airplanes out of New York City. And then, so then he got him transferred to down to uh, LAX, Los Angeles International. And so by the time they got all that done, then he was able to retire. And uh, and so he started flying out of LAX. And so they went down to find a place to live. And so they went to Huntington Beach, California. And uh, now they just the other day bought them a nice big four bedroom suite overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Wow. For $750,000. I'm sure. That's crazy. Good for them. And they're just, and the kids liking it. Their daughter is a really good volleyball player. She's, uh, Probably would get to play volleyball in college because she's good enough mm -hmm. now to see out of senior in high school. So good. So it just it just and the kids are doing good. Do you have one more? One then, more kid? Now Rhonda and Leah, and then Rocky. That's the three younger ones. Right. And then uh, Tate, and then uh, Tall and Brett. Yeah. So we got we had lost one in a car wreck. Rocky. No, it was Lauren was killed when he was 17 years old. Oh, okay. Graham Madison is the youngest boy. He's the one that's at law school. Okay. So Tall is the oldest. Brett is number two. Then Lauren was number three, but he's dead now. Got it. And then we had those three to start with. Then after we joined the church, then Pat wanted more children. So then we had four more. And then the doctor said that if you don't want your husband to have to raise seven kids by himself, you better not have any more babies. Yeah. And so she agreed. Finally, she didn't want to, but she'd had one tubular pregnancy and almost died from that. Mm -hmm. And the doctor had said, you know, here you are, you're old enough that, you know, you don't, you don't need to be having more babies. Seven is plenty. That's a lot of kids keep track of. It, but yeah. she did a super job. Yeah. I mean. She's the best wife any man could ever have, boy. I mean, just the greatest. And she has supported me my whole career from the day we got married. And, uh, you know, and, and, and we made a decision when we got married. I said, we'll raise the kids. And, uh, you know, so many people don't ever get married. They get to girlfriend pregnant but they never did marry. I said, but back in those days you was a bum if you didn't marry your girlfriend that was pregnant. And uh, I said, I couldn't be a bum. Yeah. So do you think that you all would have parted ways if you, if that hadn't have happened? Do you, oh, yeah. yeah. I would have never seen her again. When I, if, I'd, if she hadn't been pregnant, I would have left Boy City and probably, no doubt where I'd lined up at. Mm -hmm. Would be where I'm at today though. I'm sure. That was all part of the plan that we didn't realize. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. But it's the legacies that you see when you look back, see. You don't know you're building all of that at the present time. You're, you're just trying to 
raise a family and make them good and get them educated and get them all, keep them out of jail and everything. You know, it's just, it's tough. Leah was probably the most, she, she liked to run around more than anybody. She was a wild little girl all through high school in Purcell. And, uh, you know, she was, she liked to race cars she did everything. And, and she had a lot of fun, but she had talent. She, I taught her how to fly the airplane. She was the best student that I ever had. I just taught her every trick. Of, I just taught her everything I knew. Mm -hmm. And she flew 50 hours in 50 days in my little Cessna 150. And then she took the check ride with my friend and got her private pilot's license. And that's a picture of her right up there. Oh, I see that. Yeah. Above the bear. Yeah, above the bear. So, did you, uh, do all your kids fly? No, just just Leah and Tall. The rest of them don't want to fly. They get sick at Rhonda. Just get, he smell the airplane and get sick. Oh, no. But they've flown with me some, you know, but mm -hmm. they don't want to fly. They're not, they don't have that desire. They've got other passions. Bicycle racing, there's tall on the bike. See that right there? Mm -hmm. They race bicycles. They race everything. They ride all this stuff. Very athletic. They're very healthy people. Mm -hmm. They don't, no, they're not no fat ones. <laughs> well, neither are you. <laughs> yeah, no, so. Well, and, that's what I mean. Even now, you're you're retired, and yeah, you still obviously stay busy because where we're, we're sitting right now, yeah, and listening to you, yeah, your phone rings a couple times a day, and yeah, more than a couple times, yeah, you, you definitely stay busy. Um, I, well, you're it's what it is when you help a lot of people and do things for people, and they like to come in and visit and you know plan when they're having troubles or don't understand what's going on. You know, they will come around and talk to you. Mm -hmm. Everybody in town, you know, they say, they say, well, how, I said, how can we find you? And I said, well, just go in anywhere. I mean, to ask for Ron Fisher, and they'll tell you where I'm at. Because they know that I work in the temple in Oklahoma City mm -hmm. every Tuesday and Thursday. I'm up there. Nita and I are there. Pat and I did that for years. And then when I married Nita, she was past good friend, and we never quit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I can now say that I've had two of the best wives in the world. Never had, never believed that I could do this. That would be so good mm -hmm. to raise all of this bunch. It's the best, best legacy I've ever seen. A lifetime of work. Well, so we've been talking about two hours right now. So yeah. I'm, I wonder it towards... The, since we're at the end of this, if there's anything else that you wanted to talk about or anything else that, that has to do with now? Well, I don't, I don't think, well, we are pretty well told you a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I knew five minutes into the conversation that we could spend 12 hours and oh, still yeah, not get could. through we can work. We can talk here forever. The hard, yeah, the hard part is getting through... The, the basics of it, oh, but yeah. what I think is interesting and what's useful I think for this project is to get a to get a good understanding of sort of um, who you were growing up and what your family, yeah, um, your time at OSU and what what that helped. See that is shape. the greatest. That's the best time of my life. I look back at college up at Oklahoma A and M as the crux of everything that made me what I am today. You know, if it wasn't for that, you know, if I hadn't gone to Stillwater back in 1951, I would hate to think where I would have been. And, uh, but it was a foresight of teachers. I had a good English teacher in high school that went all the way from seventh grade all the way through with it. stuff like that that people that had confidence that Ron Fishburne would mount to something and you know because because when I was a freshman in high school I just where am I at you know what's you know, I come off a little old grocery store up in Goldsby I had never seen real people in town all these guys and gals that were completely different from what I'd been raised around when I arrived in Purcell 
and uh, but it's it's all been part of that and I think that's what makes life so important is that you pay attention to what's going on in the world around you and you know don't be afraid to take on tasks that maybe you're not don't know what's going to happen or not and uh and I think I credit my English teacher and my agriculture teacher as being positive influence that told me that I could amount to something. And then when I went to college, my well, Dr. Gray up there says, "You can do it." You know, you know, he was my main, he was my mainstay. And so those kind of people are what really build it when you're young. I also think it's interesting that you feel that such a pivotal time. Because um, you only stayed with your degree. You only used that degree for... Just a little while. Just a little while. Yeah, just a couple of years. But then I... But what I learned from that is if you find something that you love to do more than anything else, then do it. Don't stay with something just because it's paying you money. You know, I just said, I don't need don't need the money. I just want to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So that's why you ultimately left the soil, soil well, science business? just a political thing. I didn't like it. I didn't like, I didn't didn't like, like it. it, yeah. I was, yeah. I, I, I was sick. I wouldn't even want to get up in the morning and go to work. You know, yeah. if you know how that comes out. Yeah, because it sounds like they took you from the job you went into that you liked and moved they you moved into you something, something I didn't want to didn't be moved to. to. But yeah. see, it was all because they kept telling me, oh, it's money, money, money. Yeah. You know, and then my friend Ferris P. Allgood, he didn't worry about the money. He took the job because he loved it. But I was interrupted in my career there by the military or six months active duty for training that I had to leave the soil science business for six months. When I came back, he's gone. And then I said, you know, and the, and the boss there said, oh, don't follow them. I said, that's not any good. You'll never amount to anything. Money, you know, said you'll never make GS9, you know. And so I believed my buddy there that was, uh, he said, I'll make you the soil conservation district chairman, you know, whatever it was, district executive. And I said, well, you know, being young and you're starting out another career, then you say, well, maybe they're right, maybe, but... See, then, then whenever I got it, I said, no, that's the wrong direction. That's not the right way. I'd rather go, I'd rather go back to Purcell and sell farm machinery and run a freight business than to be a, 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 just a work unit conservationist working the paperwork mm -hmm. because, because I'd left what I'd like to do, and that was map soils. But... So then when I figured out that I loved to fly and I was able to fly, then I said, I'll never leave it. <laughs> I'm never going to quit. And you still fly. <laughs> still flying. You and still I've fly. flown and flown and flown. And uh, I still love to go out and take off in my airplane. It's the greatest feeling in the world is to taxi out and put the power to that little airplane and fly up and see the world. <laughs> There's something about that's magic. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps you going. I mean, just fantastic. And you see those old helicopters up there on the wall over there. Mm -hmm. See, I've flown all of those. On the, June, on and, the 2011 uh, calendar. Yeah, yeah. And see, and then there's Orville and Wilbur up there. See, that's my... I just finished up reading their book, The Wright Brothers by McCullough, which is the best Air Wright Brothers book that has ever been printed. And uh, it's just like a Bible of aviation. And uh, so anyway, that's why you see all of these pictures of aviators and everything. But then I never gave up. I would became a, in a rotary club. I've been there 20 some odd, 30 years nearly. And uh, rotary district governor, rotary president. I've done everything that you can do in rotary because I enjoy the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that sums up a, a big part of what we've talked about and a big part of what you've been able yeah. to say about your life. Um, I think at two hours and 15 minutes, I'm going to stop. Okay.
Because that's a long time for anyone to talk. Oh, it is. Well, it is some people. <laughs> but Ron Fishburne is different. You can keep going. <laughs> well, well, it's because I love life so much. And I know that I have a great family. Mm -hmm. And I know that I have I have made right choices. I, in the cho when I made a bad choice, I was able to solve the problem. You know, instead of telling Pat, well, you're pregnant, well, I'll just leave. You'll have to figure it out yourself. I said, no. I thought about it, thought about it, and then I said, thought, boy, that would be a horrible mistake, is to leave a little baby in this earth life without a father. She's too good a girl. I didn't, and you know, we didn't know each other, really. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know. But after 49 years and I buried her, you know, I knew that I had had a lady that was greater than any person that I could have ever picked out and found, but Heavenly Father put her into my arms. Mm -hmm. And I was smart enough to follow it. That's what is, and that's what I've been able to do is follow the premonitions. I think that's, well, I think the good advice there as well, and we'll, we will end on this, but I think the good advice there is to follow your instincts as well, right? Yeah. It is. Yeah. When it's good, do it. You know, don't do bad things. Do the good. Mm -hmm. It's just like this lady I spoke to just a while ago, and she had had a real bad injury, and she was having to be that, and, you know, and, and I said, I'll never throw your stuff out of the mini storage. From your storage business? Yeah. yeah. Because I said she was worried about that, that she hadn't paid me. And you know, and I said, don't ever worry about that. Don't ever worry about money. You know, we'll get it. We'll figure it out. Yeah. And so she was so tickled. <laughs> you know, and so you did, and that's what life is all about, is serving others. Because the rotary theme is service above self. And I learned that was service above self. I worked for uh, the Rila program now for over 25 years. I've, uh, I've been with over a thousand kids in the last 20 years, helping them through programs. What's the RILA program? Leadership. It's a leadership program mm -hmm. for young juniors that's coming out of high school. In Rotary, we have a program and we go to, it's a week, five day program down at the lake. Uh, and uh, Bob Ustry is the Man, he's the man that has, he was asked to do it and he asked me to help him and I've been with him ever since. Mm -hmm. That was, this is our 23rd or 24th year. Well, those are good skills for teenagers. Yeah. yeah. Nita goes with me. She helps me. Pat didn't like to do it, so she didn't go. And I didn't want her to go because she do not take care of babies and stuff. Yeah. Kids, not babies. <laughs> anyway, Nita is, uh, is a lot more like me. She likes to be involved and she does so many good things. Same way. Sounds like you both we do. Got, we got the best team going. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't tell any of the kids and now they've all accepted her as a, my best friend and good buddy and everything, you know. Well that's good because it's been about eight years since eight you've been years, married. Yeah. yeah. On July the 2nd, it'll be eight years. Right, close to your birthday. Yeah, and that's what my daughter's birthday right there is. July the 2nd. July 2nd. Yeah, old Rhonda. Yeah. She was named after me. I guess that's true. I yeah. didn't think about that. But it, we don't spell it R-H, it's R-O-N-D-A. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, she's college educated, done good. Brought in all these good looking kids. It's little boogers. Cute babies. Isn't that something?